Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're joined today by Carol Regan uh, of the Cupid Solidarity Campaign. And um, we're looking forward to hearing all about Cupid tonight and um, the Federation uh, de Mujeres uh, Cubanas, um, as well as the Cupid Solidarity Campaign. Um, so my name is Leanne. I'm very happy to be uh, sharing this event um, on behalf of the CYM and CPI's Women's Committee. So, um, Carol, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm the Cuba Solidarity uh, Campaign's Women's Officer. So it's very nice to be talking about women. <laughs> um, but just before I start do doing that, um, I want to just say a little bit about what we've been doing for the last um, few weeks since the uh, lockdown, since the coronavirus hit us all. Because before that, we were uh, concentrating on the blockade and getting the blockade lifted, which we haven't forgotten about. But it's now been overtaken in many ways by um, what Cuba has been doing and celebrating the efforts um, and the uh, public publicizing the efforts in the inter of the internationalism that and the humanitarianism that Cuban med medical um, people have shown over the last few weeks. They've sent about over 3000 medics to over 30 countries, Caribbean, Americas, Africa, and probably you all know Italy and Andorra because Italy have been doing some big publicity for Cuba on many of their buildings. So that's quite positive. Um, and we also want to get, we've, we've had a number of sort of webinars and Zoom meetings publicizing this. And we also want to get our supporters at the moment to push for Cuba to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. So if you aren't involved in that, there's stuff on the Cuba Solidarity web, website, which will tell you all about that, as well as a petition. Um, asking for that so it would make if we if they were obviously given the peace prize it would make a big political statement to the world so that's what we've been concentrating on in the last few weeks so okay and now i'm just going to move over uh, to a minute excuse me if i bend my head because i'm going to be reading a little bit okay so i just wanted to touch on historically some of the things that women have been doing in cuba pre-revolution. I mean, historically women have been involved in fighting injustices, organizing against slavery. There's a famous person called Carlotta Lukumi, 1840s. She was involved in that. Also against Batista, Celia Sanchez, who many of you will know, became one of the leaders of the July 26 movement, which was the precursor to the revolution. And Celia was also a member of the rebel army command and later became the secretary of the council of state and council of ministers there's a brilliant book that i read a couple of years ago called one day in december which is um, a, a biography of her life very interesting book if anybody's interested in finding out more about her but there were other women like uh Heidi santa maria melba hernandez who took part in the 1953 rebel or army assault on the moncada barracks and they were arrested and tortured along with the men. Hernandez formed the Mariana Grajales Brigade, the first all-woman platoon fighting in the revolution. And Heidi Santa Maria set up the Casa de las Americas, which if you've ever been to Cuba, they're all over this, the centers for culture. And uh, it was a cultural institution that brought together intellectuals from all over Latin America following the revolution and they are still very prominent today. Uh, I mean, women through the revolution and their involvement broke gender tattoos and took up public positions, becoming powerful role models for the next generation. The most well-known is Vilma Espen. She was the first woman to fight in the Revolutionary War and then went on to establish the uh, Federation of Cuban Women, the FMC. From the outset, women's equality was at the heart of the revolution. And after the revolution, one of Fidel's first speeches was, and I'll quote you, they, women, are victims of discrimination at work and in other aspects of life. When our revolution is judged in the years to come, 
one of the questions that will be asked is how our society and our country resolve the problems of women, even though this is one of the problems of the revolution that requires the most determination and firmness, the most perseverance and effort. So Fidel was pretty well behind the whole uh, emancipation of women. Women were also uh, very prominent and instrumental in the um, 1961 literacy campaign, which was a very extremely successful campaign. Um, and they you know, went from the cities when they were 14 years old and younger into the countryside with the campesinos teaching old men, young men to read and write. And that had a massive effect, not just uh, on literacy within the country, but on themselves. They became more confident and took up positions further on uh, down their careers. And prior to the revolution, none of this was possible. Obviously, women were just working in the home, looking after their children, etc. Apparently, a, approximately 100,000 women were involved in prostitution prior to the revolution. And when the FMC was founded, they concentrated on re getting them, re-educating them, getting them back into the workforce. Many of them trained to be, ner to be uh, nurses and to build the healthcare because Prostitutes are not prostitutes out of choice. It's economic necessity. Um, so the FMC is pretty much um, involved in that campaign. Um, as I say, many went on to build the National Health Service in Cuba. And today the FMC's primary task though is to guarantee justice for women in the workplace and at home. Um, it has a research wing which provides input into government laws relating to women on well, a whole range of issues from employment, health, aging, domestic violence. It's got an education wing, which works at all levels of society, raising awareness on all issues affecting women, including the use of misogynistic language. Cuba has a plan for the advancement of women since 1997, with each ministry reporting to the FMC annually on, on their progress on the number of things they're doing. It has 4 million members, and remember Cuba's got a population of 11 million. 1,600 paid professionals, 150,000 volunteers. It's got its own publishing house and two quarterly magazines. You can join from the age of 14. It costs you three Cuban pesos, which, well, it's nothing. Um, uh, they've got offices nationwide um, and they have an orientation house in most of the major provinces um, with a range of services set from helping women to set up businesses, training for different skills, workshops and issues such as domestic violence and men are, can get involved too, plus counsellors for family mediation, etc. So the FMC formed part of the commission which drew up the uh, Cuba's 1975 constitution and the 1976 Family Code, which is extremely important. And I should have said that it's the 60th anniversary of the FMC this year, and Cuba Solidarity was intending to invite members of the FMC over to do a tour. Well, we'll have to maybe postpone that and look at another timetable at some point. Anyway, so the Family Code, um, which was passed in 1976, involves reinforcing equality under the law, it covers marriage, divorce, paternity, adoption, parental responsibilities for the care and education of children, protects the rights of women to education, healthcare, social security, employment rights, pay and job protection benefits for maternity leave, flexibility for breastfeeding and childcare. Developed over time as a result of the work of the FMC and trade unions, they work very closely with the trade unions. Women are entitled to 18 weeks, that's gobsmacking this really, of paid maternity leave and 100% of their weekly income. So they get 100% for 18 weeks. After that, uh, either parent is eligible for up to 40 weeks at 60% of their pay. Um, when they return to their jobs, women are allowed one hour a day to breastfeed. And the FMC was instrumental in revising the law in 2003 that gave mothers and fathers the opportunity to choose who takes the 40 weeks of leave. So also Article 26 of 1976 Family Code states that marriage is an equal union 
and that household labour and childcare should be shared between both parents. So the impact of that on women, as you can imagine, is from 5% of the workforce before the revolution, they are now women 50%. 70% of uh, uh, workers are women, women in education and health jobs, 66% lawyers, 40% of jobs with foreign investors uh, are women. A second highest number of parliamentarians at 53.2% at the moment. The world average is 23% in, in the UK. I don't know about Ireland actually, 32%. I'm sure it's not that much different. Um, so the, I think the one above it is Rwanda. Uh, who's got more women uh, in Parliament. Also in the Council of State, which is a bit like our cabinet here, 45.2% uh, and we've got 26 over here. So they are members of the cabinet. So although uh, it, it's brilliant, you know, there's m massive progress there um, and they hold 70% of all professional jobs, they only hold 35% of director and executive positions. I mean, still impressive compared to other countries, but nevertheless, it's not, it's not the Cubans don't think it's good enough, all right? Um, so there's major discussions taking place at the moment on changes to the family code. I mean, it's been halted because of the virus and they were hoping to implement it this year, but I think it's probably going to be delayed. And most importantly, it is going to be a change in the description of the family unit from uh, currently is like a, a nuclear family, you know, a, 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 a kind of old old type relationship, as they would like to say, a nuclear type family. But it, this amendments hopefully will be more inclusive. So you can have single sex marriage. Well, you can at the moment anyway, but it will be included in, in law. Single sex marriages, transgender, um, and, you know, hopefully moving along those lines. So that will be, the discussion is not easy, I have to say, because there are still machismo present in in a large degree in Cuba. So the battle is is there, but it, it's you know it's being led by the FMC and others. Uh, Mariela Castro, I don't know if you know, she's involved. She's uh, represents uh, Senisex, which is the Center for Sex Sexual ed, Sex Education and Health. So all of that is being led by by leading women and as I said it's the machismo barrier to equality which still exists in the day-to-day -day lives of women um, for example you know women still look after the home largely they are the ones who take up the 40 weeks so it's a big sort of it's, as they described it once it's a revolution within the revolution that needs to take place and also Spanish colonial rule and the ro role of Catholics over over time takes a lot to eradicate it from the culture and society, but you know, progress is being made. So um, the family code sets out all the legal requirements, but there's education work goes on um, with trade unionists raising it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so as I say, women still bearing the brunt of um, household responsibilities. So that hopefully will change. Um, but also, um, as I said earlier, that kind of machismo is a, is a barrier still. Um, and I just wanted to um, talk very briefly about LGBT as well, because that's been a major, I mean, people throw criticism at, at Cuba that, you know, it's anti, it's homophobic, it's not. I mean, it's become a, a place where many gay and lesbians go because they feel safe and it's, for example, um, when you look at what they've been doing in oh, I can't, 2005, I, I don't know if you know the film Pride, which was made, it's about um, gay, um, a, gay, a gay group of, of men who went into Wales and support the miners. And it's a film about that. And it's a very brilliant film. Um, and they showed that on national TV in Cuba. So it was beginning to bring up the debates, you know, um, and it was introduced by Mariela Castro uh, on the TV. And then in 2008, um, they instituted Interna International Day Against Homophobia. And that carries on today. Um, and there is a, a month of education and discussion about, about the, the whole thing. 2012 was the first trans person elected to public office. 
um, in Cuba. Um, and then in 2013, the new Labour Code ha included anti-discriminatory laws based on sexuality. So those are some of the things that have been achieved in Cuba and will continue to be achieved. And I just wanted, and you asked me to say something about the influence of the church. Well, nowhere, there's over 50 religions in Cuba. And most of them are divided up into, um, well, Catholics, which are about 59%, and Santeria and offshoots of Santeria, um, which is from Yoruba, from the uh, African uh, slaves who, brought, who, who were brought over. Um, and they practice that religion. If you're there, that's probably one of the religious religions you're most aware of in Cuba. Uh, but nobody, all religions are respected in Cuba. Nobody's prevented from practicing their religion. Um, although at the moment I understand that the, the United States is trying to um, fund some of the kind of Pentecostal churches to undermine Cuba in whatever ways they can, you know, and I think it's the same. But, you know, recently they had the Pope visit, when was it, a couple of years ago, and a second visit of a Pope, and it was massively celebrated by everybody. It was like a big fiesta. Um, so, but, you know, nevertheless, there's still a traditional, you know, it's, I don't know, it's like I was brought up Catholic. If people ask, you know, are you a Catholic? You might say, yeah, I'm not anymore, no, but people say they are Catholic. So 78%, uh, uh, not saying that's, that's, that's Ireland, 59% might say they're Catholics, but 2% go to church at any one time. And if you look at the realities, abortion on demand, free and on demand, uh, the divorce rate is pretty high and, you know, it, it speaks for itself that people, you know, the women take the take it into them, you know, what's best for them and the circumstances. So I think the, I don't think it's that dramatic an effect, but, you know, with the funding situation, you never know what, you know, undermining things might go on. But I think at the moment people are pretty strong in what they want. They, they want equality. And anything that comes in between them getting that equality won't go down very well in Cuba. So um, I think I could stop there. And if you want, I can answer any questions that people have got for me. I'm sorry if I went on too long. No, not at all, Carl. That was so informative. And um, thank you so much for all of that information. So many great statistics in there, loads that I did not know at all. And, you know, it, it's great to talk to someone who, you know, actively you know tries to to bring these things to light you know because as we know we don't really hear them in the news or anything like that no. um, and it, it's very interesting uh, first of all what you were saying about uh, trying to get the Nobel Peace Prize bestowed upon you but that's uh, how, how is that going is it going well yeah well the, there's a petition as I said and it's 2021 when the Peace Prize is is given so mm -hmm. we've got I don't know when they decide, but certainly it is, it's a polit, you know, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't hold my breath at saying they get it, but I think the campaign um, to do that is very important, you know, that we say these are, I mean, they've been celebrated by many people what they've done in, uh, with the coronavirus and visiting countries at their own risk and, uh, you know, this, and the whole thing with Ebola and other, other sort of, um, illnesses and uh, you know viruses and whatever that they've been involved in fighting um, and giving health care to different countries I mean I think that's something that we should be celebrating and everybody should be celebrating for no cost for no cost absolutely absolutely yeah and yeah. um, you touched on so many great things there and um, the roles that women played in the revolution was so interesting and the Federation of Cuban Women of course in the family code um, and about LGBTQ people um, all very interesting stuff. Uh, great to hear, you know, because that's one of the things that I, I've heard thrown around, you know, um, and it's wonderful to hear that, you know, um, machismo kind of thinking is being, you know, constantly um, challenged by, like you said, four million women in, in, in the FMC is absolutely incredible. Um, so I have a few more questions. Um, so 
Um, one is how has the FMC evolved since its foundation in 1960? Um, and uh, how has the struggle for women's liberation in Cuba changed over time, do you think? Um, during the last, what, what anniversary did you say it was this year? 60. It's 60 this year. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. OK. Well, I think, um, as I said earlier, the uh, Vilma Espens um, set up with um, Fidel Castro, the two of them, the Federation of Cuban Women um, in 1960. And since then, of course, it's developed. It, it's the organization itself has developed so that it has roots everywhere throughout the country. And, you know, it has representatives um, on the government. It has, I think, two places in government um, and which has been recognized. And they are completely independent, whatever people say. They are an independent body, separate from government, and they influence government when they need to, when they can. So that um, has obviously developed over the years with um, local representation, and they come together annually to to discuss policy, etc. So, you know, it isn't just regional. I mean, and uh, for those of you who know Cuba, travel is not easy in Cuba. It's not the most uh, well. It's not easiest thing to get around. It's better than it was, and if the blockade was lifted, it lifted, it would be much much better when they'd be able to buy more buses and you know do that sort of thing. So they've. They have um, developed local structures over the years to involve um, women in various areas. So nobody's, you know, just kind of getting rid of the isolation that you can have in many areas if you're not involved in the city. And setting up these centers where women can go and get advice and training, they're all part of the development of the FMC, you know, to make sure that all women where they need to be are involved. And they, you know, they raise the, the women are able to raise through the conferences and discussions their concerns, what they want to see prioritized. So it's a de democrat democratization of the FMC that we've seen over the years, you know. Um, so and they re they um, elect their their representatives on a regular basis. I can't remember how often, but they they always seem to be changing to me anyway. So they do elect their representatives on a on a on a basis. Uh, and as, the, as you were saying, there's struggle over time. I mean, one of the things about the FMC is they, are, they don't operate outside of the Cuban um, priorities, if you like. At the FMC, we're very much involved in um, the, the freeing of the five campaign. You know, that was a priority. It was a priority for all the countries. So, that, that the struggle changes depending on the struggle that the Cubans face, but within that, prioritizing the issues that face women. And as I said, all the information about how things have changed for women over the years, how positive things are, they continually change. You know, having 40 weeks um, paid leave for either parent is a massive, I mean, if we had that in this country, that would be revolutionary anyway, but get then the next stage is, is going, getting through this machismo, this kind of getting the men educated, and it's obviously the men, to recognizing that, you know, they're, they're, to have equality, their role has to change as well. So that is the main, one of the major concerns. And the, the discussion about, LBGT plus is not an easy discussion because of that. So, you know, having, showing films on television, Mariela Castro organizing to um, have these demonstrations at uh, the celebration of gay and homosexuals um, every year through the, uh, the International Day of home Anti-Homophobic Stuff, you know. So she, she's very much involved in that and she's a leading figure. Um, and she came out, I don't even remember, there was the accusation that Cuba was homophobic. She came over and spoke at the Pride demonstration in London um, about two or three years ago. Yeah, and was well received. So that was, you know, a major, major breakthrough. So as I say, things change, things will evolve. And the Cubans, the FMC would say, you know, 
it, we're not got equality yet. We're working towards it. We've made, they're, they're very hard on themselves, I always think. They've made great gains, but you know, there's still a lot of work to do. The domestic violence, it's not, uh, domestic violence is not physical, as for, it's not as physical, it's more a mental domestic violence that they're looking at. The way people are, you know, women are looked at, the way they're spoken to, etc. all of those things are something that the Cubans are addressing. So I don't know if that answers that bit. Oh, it absolutely does. So thanks so much for that. Again, so informative. And I mean, it is, it gives you a lot of hope to hear, you know, that, you know, all these women are out there, you know, slowly but surely making these gains because you can't get everything overnight, you know, as we know, but, you know, to go out there and, and to cry, you know, and, and put in the work to, to really challenge those things. I don't, yeah. I don't know if you've been to Cuba, but whenever I've been, I'm always amazed by the confidence that women have, the way they, you know, um, speak at meetings, the way they are completely uh, confident in their way, that, that whether it's their job or whether it's on the street or whatever, they're completely different than the women and girls that I see. It, it's just a different atmosphere altogether. And when you also see um, women in positions like, head of the TUC, I know we've got a head of the TUC here, a woman, but head of the, all the unions, you know, not just white women, but black women as well. I mean, some of the black comrades, I, I used to be a member of the National Union of Teachers. I was the president of the National Union of Teachers. And, you know, to have a woman, <laughs> to see all these women who are in positions um, at that level, is, is just very encouraging, you know, very encouraging. And as I say, just the way that, you know, you go into schools and you see schools and school children behave in a different way. Girls are not subservient in any way, shape or form. In fact, quite the opposite, you know. So it is, there are, there are positive things which maybe the Cubans don't always see because they're in it every day. But when you go there, this is one of the things that stands out, you know, for me is the way that women conduct themselves and are integrated at every level of, of Cuban society. Absolutely, I'd say it's amazing to, to see. Um, that leads on really well into my next question, which is um, how is feminism in Cuba? Um, and I suppose the, the role that the FNC have, are, 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 have created um, address the challenges and contradictions inherent in liberal bourgeois feminism. Because um, obviously it is uh, quite different um, over here in a capitalist um, and imperialist countries. Yeah. Well, I don't think women in Cuba would say they were feminist. Uh, I wouldn't say that they would say that. I mean, I've never asked them, but I've never had a discussion with women that where they've said they're feminists. They are socialists, they are communists, they are um, revolutionaries within that. and the equality issue, it's it's there, it's got to be, because you can't be a socialist and not have a, a major offensive on equality matters. So it doesn't, as far as this, it's not part of a discussion. I think probably they've now had discussions on the Me Too thing, um, the Me Too movement and other things like that. But it, it's it's an entitlement that women have and know they have they have that equality and they don't have to have a separate movement like we, you know, we have in, in, well, Western countries have, you know, this Me Too, uh, you know, the, the, all the sort of recent stuff that's been going on. Um, it's not, it's not ne necessary in Cuba. I don't think women feel that's needed because they have a voice through the FMC. They have a voice they have a voice with government. Um, there's always somewhere they can go to talk to if they feel something isn't right, you know. So in a sense, it's it's something that we can't, we're not used to, you know, it's not something that we have. So until we have that, we wouldn't necessarily understand that for them, feminism is just, it, it isn't a movement as such, if you know what I mean, it's not, you know, their, their attitudes is, is completely different because they do have on paper the equality. It's making sure that it's uh, enacted in every every 
level of satiety that's uh, that's the challenge you know that they have so yeah I mean that answers it doesn't it I mean that just absolutely answers the question you know yeah. um, to have that kind of thing that is it's hard to even imagine for mm. me sitting here hearing that you know it's, it's hard to even imagine you know being in a society where it's just embedded in society you don't need a separate word for it no um, so no. that's amazing yeah um so let me see now i wanted to ask you about the women's center in havana um i hear they do very good work and um, so i was wondering if you would let us all know uh if you know when it when it was established or uh what kind of work they do there and what kind of services they provide well it's it's one of the um centers that i was talking out about before which uh or which offers a whole range of um training support within um havana um and i can't remember when it was set up some time ago i, I couldn't find the uh, date at which it was set up but it's been going quite some time and i think it was the model that was used to then um have the similar organizations in all the provinces so that you know the organization um where there 150 uh, i don't know volunteers 150,000 volunteers and then they've got work full-time workers that's where the, some of them are actually based within those centers to give women all the support they needed whether it's from as i say training for jobs even you know some skills that they can learn it's like not evening classes, but there are classes that women can join to develop their skill set and then um, get different jobs or just go for support and advice if they've got any ish major issues that they want to talk about or even, even minor issues. There's always somebody supporting them there. And I think that's the success of it. I mean, if it, it's not like a women's refuge or anything like that, but it's more of an educational support service, you know, and I think... Um, as I say, it's it's been a model for many. I've never been to it. I've never been to it, but you know, I do. I, I am aware of of what it what it is doing. It, you know, in terms of that that area of positive input for women. Yeah, that's what it does. Amazing. Um, I suppose you were talking earlier about like free um uh, on demand abortions. Yeah. Um, so the those centers like the the women's center in Havana, would they they would provide other forms of contraception as well i presume i think they're probably i think i think some of them have got uh doctors that are um attached to the center i mean there are doctors everywhere in cuba <laughs> they'd have a doctors of, uh, and advice you know uh for women who wanted an abortion they could go there to ask but I generally get the feeling that if women want an abortion, there's no problem. They just go to the doctor and say, and then that's it. You know, um, that's how it happens. It's not, they don't feel that they, they're not going to get supported by going to their local GP, but certainly there will be, they do, they do uh, have set, um, within these centers, they do have uh, people dealing with women's health. You know, I mean, often women don't want to talk about their health issues to a man. So there would be women doctors available for them to at the center. I know that they look in they they do deal with healthcare as well. So I'd forgotten that bit. Yeah. Yeah, well, incredible. Uh it's so interesting, as you were saying earlier. Also, I forgot to tell you as well. Yeah. Um trans um the uh elect surgery, the um surgery for you know, when people want to transition is is free uh, in Cuba. And available to those who, I mean, obviously, they go through different um, discussions, you know, about why they're doing it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it is available and has been available for some years now. The trans, you know, surgery for transition. But as I say, there's a lot of support mechanisms within that. It isn't just a question of going in and saying I want to transition now. Um, you know, there would be different discussions uh, that, that go on. I don't know the full full inside of it, but certainly um, it's the surgery is available uh, on in free, free, yeah. Hard to even comprehend, isn't it? I know. <laughs> yes, it is. Wow. 
Oh, it's so interesting what you're saying. Um, what you're saying earlier, even even with that statement you just made there as well, um, and and about abortions, um, and how you know, so many people in the in the population would be religious and not necessarily, like you know, heavily religious of going to mass or anything, but that the religion doesn't actually impinge on, as you were saying, like the socialist, the the communism that that you know, that they're building um, and that they have built. Uh, I just think it's... I think the church would find it difficult if it asked... I mean, when I've I've listened to a number of priests on occasion and they're very supportive of the revolution, some of them. Hmm. And I'm sure that if they were... If they asked women <laughs> to choose at certain points, they might not like the answer because, you know, women are not... The women in Cuba... Are not prepared to go backwards to what they to go back to what they had. Mm -hmm. So if you ask them the question, you know, would you give up your right to an abortion? The answer would be a clear no. So that's why they never asked the question. I mean, I don't. I, you know, the Catholic Church is not oppressed. People can go to mass. They can do what they like. You know, so I think it's a kind of some sort of harmony, I would say, <laughs> um, with, I mean, some of the churches are a bit balmy, I think, some of the, you know, smaller, odd churches that they have there, the Pentecostals, but I think they're so tiny um, that they're completely irrelevant, you know, um, which is why I'm surprised that the American government thinks it can give them more money and undermine the revolution in some way, but yeah, anyway, yes. They're not asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I let me see. I'm asking the Irish now: Would you give it up? Would you give up what all the gains that you've made? No, <laughs> no. Yeah, anyway. it's very different here. Yeah, so um, very entwined. Yeah, but um, I only really have one more question. If you, you just you. Yeah. So much information um, and answered so many things I, I wanted to know and I'm sure so many people wanted to hear from you so thank you so much for all the information that you've given um, and how clearly and simply you've put it all um, so digestible <laughs> um, so I suppose my last one is about the new constitution so yeah. I'm, I'm aware that uh, two years ago I'm pretty sure and the whole country uh, got together and was able to you discuss the new constitution and and vote voted through. Um, and I was wondering, yeah. how about that? Um, I can't remember some of the. It was a lot of it was to do with employment laws and protecting um, protecting women more. And there was they did try and uh, put into the constitution um, the thing about. Uh, changing the family unit um, and the Cuban people are not ready for that yet so that was one of the areas of discussion which is now coming up again um, they're not giving up on it but that was one of the areas whereas everything else and you know when P when the Cubans have a, a discussion about the constitution or a change in whatever policy they have loads of discussions they have a discussion at the um, trade union within their uh, workplace, outside of the trade union, within the CDR, you know, the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, which are a bit like uh, tenants associations. Um, so they have discussions across all sectors. I mean, sometimes the Cubans say to me, we talk about it too much, you know. One, a friend of ours went to six different consultations on uh, changing aspects of the constitution. <laughs> Um, so they have a full, full debate about it. And, you know, some of the things were just, and, you know, changing the law to make things more secure for people. Mm. Um, I mean, I know you said something about ra racism and race and how that fits in. I mean, um, there is a big debate going on at the moment about uh, eliminating racism from society because there is, I mean, it, it's not, it, it's interesting because many of the black comrades who go every year, the NEU, the National Education Union, sends a delegation to Cuba every year. And many of them are black comrades and they feel completely at home in Cuba. 
but it's things like and you do see black members at every level of society and trade unions and things but it's that um it's language um it's the job situation sometimes black members black uh, cubans are not necessarily get the best jobs um and you know it's in that debate about what constitutes racism is going on at the moment and it's very interesting um you know pulling no punches but i mean it's out there and cubans are talking about it and it's you know it's a very important step and given the sort of black lives matter um issues that are around at the moment it's very appropriate you know but as i say the black comrades all, always feel at home so they're doing something right but it is those other issues the you know the as i say the language the jobs that maybe some um black cubans don't have and there aren't i think you said something to me about um indigenous there aren't any indigenous i think they got wiped out fairly early on um before the spanish arrived um yeah that i don't there, i don't know whether there was some disease as well um but there are as far as the cubans know there aren't any there may be some part of somebody in somebody's dna but certainly there's no indigenous people at the moment in in cuba there haven't been for some hundreds of years i think i don't know when it all happened but mm. yeah anyway so that's all jumbled up together there yeah just yeah uh, it's it's horrible you know i mean it is incredible for a country that was so absolutely bombarded with you know Spain had it, and then you know the Dutch wanted it, and then just like British had a bit, yeah. British had a bit to do with it. The Americans, yeah. Every- just, such a horrible, bloody history, you know. To, yeah. I mean, to be what it is today, it is truly inspirational. So amazing. I actually thought when you were speaking there of one last question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Something that came into my mind was, um, you know, you you were telling me um about um you know, women's maternity leave and how women can join the FMC from the age of 14 and young women in schools and uh, young girls and how, you know, they're not subsidiary bins in any way. So I was wondering if you knew anything about elderly women um, and how they would be treated in Cuba um, and, and, and how it would differentiate, I suppose, from the kind of capitalist countries that we live in um, yeah. today. Well, interesting, actually, um, that the changes the proposing they're proposing changes to the family code and one of the changes is to do with the elderly because at the moment the elderly are generally looked after by within the family and there is an aging population in cuba the birth rate is dropping quite a bit um so they go they're looking at alternatives to support like not all people's homes and and that kind of thing but within Cuba, anyway, if you sometimes in Cuba, there are many sort of parks, little squares, you know, and you often see old people doing exercises. Um, there is, there are, you, you know, they take this kind of um, social clubs for the elderly. They take them out um, for trips <laughs> and you see them going on trips. They try to look after them as much as possible but yet again same as most countries you know the burden falls on on women to look after the aging parents etc so that's why they are looking at changing the family code to give elderly people the right to be looked after by the state as well so that there will be i suppose care homes you know homes that they can go to i mean a big issue for the Cubans is uh, housing. It's a massive, massive issue, um, particularly with the blockade and inability to get building materials um, because of the blockade. Um, and so they, you know, they try to build houses, and sometimes they build houses, and then there's a hurricane, and how then that area that's had the hurricane has to be prioritised for rebuilding of housing. So it's a difficult situation, but certainly with the blockade it does make it impossible almost to you know can't get cement and stuff like that although they are 
they've got scientists working on alternatives all the time so but you know that kind of issue like finding homes for the elderly because the families are overcrowded you know they'll all live together in a small house you know so that is a um, a major priority um for them so with the, looking after the elderly i mean the um the rate of um life what is it called lifespan whatever mm -hmm. is i think 80 something for women in cuba which is better than some um, so-called developed countries mm. i think it's better than the united states but don't quote me on that i think it is i need to check that <laughs> it wouldn't surprise you. <laughs> it's pretty high it's pretty high and it's nearly 80 for men i think mm. yeah wow. Yeah, I, I know that the infant mortality rate is the same as Ireland, you know, and it's, it's low. Yeah, it's low. Yeah. And and they they say that they, you know, they don't have anything over there and, you know, that we're so built up and stuff, but it's the same, you know. Yeah, I once, when we visited, we once went and I visit, we visited a maternity home where women who were, uh, they, the doctors thought that they weren't eating properly, they weren't looking after themselves properly, needed to get away from the family, had too many other children to look after. They went a couple of weeks before the birth of the child to these homes. They got properly, proper food, they got looked after, constant medical care attention. And these, I think there's a hundred or more of these maternity homes uh, in Cuba. So, you know, there's all that support as well you know, that they have, so, and it's very, very impressive when, <laughs> when I've seen these places, yeah, you think, God, yeah, what a, what a good idea. And you can only imagine what they could do if the blockade wasn't in place, or if, when it, it, ever it is in place. And, you know, they don't have to go to China for buses, they could get it from Miami, 90 miles away, but no, they have to get it, from, they have to get everything from China. Mm. Uh, more or less. I mean, you know, all the electrical goods, everything comes China. I mean, here, you probably know this, but anybody who has any financial dealings with uh, Cuba and has an American element to it would be fine. They're not allowed to trade with Cuba. So, um, you know, we've had, instance, uh, we've had instances where Barclays Bank, for example, cashed a check and got fined $675,000 for cashing a very small amount of money. So the Americans, I mean, and Trump, of course, has ratcheted it, ratcheted it up somewhat. And, uh, you know, things like remittances, which many Cubans rely on, which is money coming from the states um, that families send there to support them that's been um, attacked, it's been reduced and making it more and more difficult for Cubans to get any extra help that they can. I mean, not everybody's got relatives in the States, but those that have, um, you know, it's just, it's just devastating really. And it's lots of things are, that Trump's doing at the moment, trying to squeeze Cuba even more. So. But despite all that, still the, the international solidarity that you were saying earlier, when it comes to, to COVID and, the PPP, PPE, um, you know, despite, you know, the blockade and, you know, how little, you know, money that they do have, you yeah. know, what they do, I do know. with it, how yeah. they spend it. Yeah, yeah, I know, it is amazing, actually, but they do have a humanitarianism, which is quite in incredible. Um, you know, it's not just always about money and, you know, getting Cubans. It's, it's, they care. <laughs> it's as simple as that. They care, you know, and obviously um, it's not always portrayed as that, but that's what it is. It's, that's what we would always argue is because Cubans are internationalists. They care about people around the world. So that's why they do it. Yeah. Well. Awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. On that note, I suppose I don't have anything else um, to ask you, but um, if you have anything else to add, um, you can think of anything at all uh, before we finish up. 
Um, I don't think so. As I say, let's push on with the uh, getting them the Nobel Peace Prize. They deserve it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for Very all you've done with the Cuba International, um, sorry, the Cuba Solidarity Campaign. I'm pushing for something like that. Um, and I wish you the absolute best luck. Um, well, you can join us. You can join us even. You can join online and sign the petition. Go to the Cuba Solidarity website. Sign, get you to sign the petition. That's good. Absolutely. Is it Cuba Solidarity Campaign? Dot, dot org? Dot... Yeah, so I think it's Cuba Solidarity Altogether Campaign. Beautiful. Or dot org, is it? I can't remember. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> Just Google it. Google it. <laughs> Google it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't look at the Wikipedia. Just get the yeah. <laughs> Pain up there. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, well, and the petition. That's what we say. Brilliant. Onwards and upwards. <laughs> Viva la Hasta Sempre, huh? Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> Victoria, yes. Uh, yeah. Well, Carol, thank you so much for all of that. Um. You're very um, sorry, go on. You're very welcome. Oh, no, I enjoyed it. Been, it's been lovely talking to you. Absolutely lovely. Um, thanks a million. Um, good, good luck. Good luck to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> and good luck to everybody watching. Yes, yeah. Bye, everybody. Watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>